Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Tuesday, March 21st. And here are some of the stories we are covering. Forces are training West African troops to counter the growing terror threat spreading from the Sahel region. Meanwhile, security experts say Burkina Faso and Mali have essentially fallen into terrorist groups, meaning the U.S. and security partners are now looking at containing the Sahel conflict rather than stopping it entirely. Henry Wilkins reports from Sogakopa, Ghana. Troops from Morocco and Ghana get ready for an over-the-beach raid as part of Flintlock, the annual US-led military exercise in West Africa, which this year took place in Ivory Coast and Ghana. A soldier from the Ghanaian Special Boat Service, who declined to be named for security reasons, described the exercises. It's been two weeks of intensive training and uh, some of the areas included uh, mission planning, uh, visit board seizure and search, VBSs, uh, tactical site exploitation, yeah, we did sensitive site exploitation. One of the U.S. officers running the exercise hinted that Ghana had a big role to play in security efforts as a long-running conflict with groups linked to al-Qaeda and Islamic State militants spread to the north of coastal West African countries. We are concerned, of course, with the terror threat coming from the north. And Flintlock is uh, absolutely about pulling our partners together to help protect against that threat. I, I think from, from uh, the international community, we're really focused on Ghana. Ghana is a center of stability and real capability in coastal West Africa. Analysts say U.S. security efforts are shifting focus from landlocked countries to the north, like Burkina Faso and Mali, to coastal West Africa. The Burkina Faso and Mali governments have struggled to halt attacks and military advances by militant groups, leading to instability in both countries. Asked whether the conflict against terror groups in Burkina Faso has essentially already been lost, one expert replied... I think to a large extent we can say that. Uh, I mean, there's still a government in Mali and there's still a government in Burkina Faso and they still control some areas. But I think the reality is that large portions of the populations in these countries are no longer under government control. Annalise Bernard, a strategic stabilization advisor, is a former advisor to the U.S. Department of State's Bureau for Conflict and Stabilization Operations in Niger. She told VOA that the U.S. appears to be increasingly looking to contain the terror threat from the Sahel instead of trying to prevent it. I do think that um, a version of containment is going to start to take place um, at a more aggressive level, wherein we start to fortify the northern borders of those coastal West African states that I mentioned, um, ensure that all the other coastal states also remain as strong as possible, but keep a, keep our key alliance in Niger. Analysts say that the U.S. is paying more attention to the Sahel conflict as great powers like Russia and China begin to show more interest and influence in the region. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited the Sahel last week to pledge support, while Vice President Kamala Harris is due to visit Ghana later this month. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Sogokope, Ghana. In Nigeria, the ruling All Progressive Congress Party, the APC, appears to be making gains in the latest results from Saturday's governorship and state assembly elections. This, as the Independent National Elections Commission, INEC, has declared the results from Adamawa State polls to be inconclusive. Joining us from Abuja is journalist Medina Dauda of Viewers Hausa Language Service. The latest in the governorship election results in Nigeria shows that Adamawa the home state of the former vice president and the presidential candidate of the PDP, Atiku Abubakar, has suffered a setback because we were expecting the results sometime yesterday evening. Unfortunately, what we got was that the tight race between the incumbent governor, Ahmadou Fintiri, and Senator Aisha Tahiru Binani has been declared inconclusive. And apart from that, there's another state that is following Adamawa, which is Kebi State. That state is also declared inconclusive, which means of the 13 results that we have, two are inconclusive. Why did INEC, the Elections Commission, declare these elections inconclusive? Well, what we got was that there are some local governments that had some problems, more than 
40 or that about polling units were suspended and then the results of that local government could not be collated. So what they did was to suspend the entire declaration of the election results. That is why they called it inconclusive. As things stand, how many races have been declared so far and which of the two leading parties, the PDP and uh, the APC, would you say is winning or is in the lead in terms of uh, the governor's count? Well, one thing that I think will be of interest to you and our listener is that the ruling APC has pulled some surprises in the governorship election that was held on Saturday, 18th of March. Because so far, APC is leading in its winning streak as it retains Katuna, Jigawa, Yobe, Lagos, Kwara, Gombe, Kaduna, Nasarawa, and Borno State. That makes nine. And then it reclaimed Sokoto State, and it won in Eboni and Benue State, which means APC alone has 12 states so far. What can you tell us, Medina, about this suspended Roman Catholic priest who has won the governorship election in Benue State? The Catholic priest who won the governorship elections in Benue State, Reverend Hyacinth Alia, was suspended from public ministry in the year 2022. That was last year for getting involved in partisan politics. The suspension was by the uh, Bishop of Boko Catholic Diocese, Most Reverend William Avenia. Medina, it's a pleasure always to speak with you. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you, James. Have a great day. I was journalist Medina Dauda of Views Hausa Language Service speaking with us from Abuja, Nigeria. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Botti in Washington. Today is Tuesday, March 21st. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Streets in South Africa were largely deserted on Monday and shops closed as citizens heeded calls by the Economic Freedom Fighters Party for a national shutdown. The EFF is demanding measures to end the constant power cuts, job losses, and continuing economic hardships. It also wants President Cyril Ramaphosa to resign following a scandal in which millions of dollars hidden in a sofa at his farm were allegedly stolen. Tusokumalo reports. From Johannesburg. The leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters Party, EFF, Julius Malema, told protesters gathered near the offices of President Cyril Ramaphosa's union buildings in Pretoria that the stay away was very successful. Most eateries, shopping malls, and major businesses shut their doors in all major cities in South Africa, bringing the economy close to a standstill. A few people were in town, however, roaming the streets or visiting the few open shops. Malema criticized those who said it was business as usual, saying they expected violence and looting, but the EFF delivered a peaceful shutdown. Today, there is no big mall, there is no small mall, no shop, no factory, no school, no nothing. In the Johannesburg Business District, many streets were empty and businesses closed. Simpure Stambu, a resident of Johannesburg, spoke to VOA and expressed full support for the national shutdown. I'm not at work just because of the shutdown, but uh, everything seems to be okay. There's, um, there's still uh, peace. Uh, there's no violence yet. Businesses also came to a standstill in Pretoria and resident John Mutwene told VOA that citizens are not happy at all about how the country is being administered by the president. He promised people a lot of things. He said he promised job for young people. He promised everyone 
better life, but none of those things are happening in this country. So Sir Ramaphosa is the man without his weight. So Sir Ramaphosa must go. South Africa is currently facing economic difficulties with many jobs on the line. The power cuts have seen some citizens going for up to 12 hours without electricity. Meanwhile, the government has vowed that the thousands of soldiers and police officers deployed to maintain peace and order during the national shutdown will remain on the streets till April. The government and those who sought to interdict the national shutdown, including business leaders, have yet to respond on the impact of the nationwide protest since Malema said it was going to end at midnight today. Reporting for VOA News, I am Tuso Kumalo in Johannesburg. In South Africa, the opposition Economic Freedom Fighters Party is vowing to force President Cyril Ramaphosa to step down before his term officially expires. This after launching a nationwide shutdown protest on Monday, demanding the president's resignation because of the recent theft at his Pala Pala farm, corruption in public institutions, high youth unemployment, and load shedding. President Ramaphosa put the military on alert, saying the EFF is attempting to overthrow his administration. For more on the shutdown, viewers Peter Clotte reach Mpili Mautwe, a parliamentarian and a treasurer general of the EFF party. Our reasons for demanding Mr. Ramaphosa to step down is because mainly of the Palapala farm scandal, where the president stashed dollars in between his uh, couches and sofas, which were never declared, which he, by the way, confirmed himself that indeed he had those dollars in his house, in his farm, and those dollars were then stolen. And what he also did, he took the state machinery, the police helicopters and the vans and the police themselves to go and hunt the, the alleged uh, perpetrators by himself without having notified the police or opened the case of theft at the police. But also one of the reasons why we want Mr. Ramaphosa to resign, to resign is because under his presidency, we've seen high levels of unemployment. We've seen high levels of inequality. We've seen high levels of joblessness. Our people are landless. They don't have the land. They don't have, when they are employed, they are underpaid at work. But, but on Pili, how feasible is this demand for his resignation and what are the prospects that he will resign after all these attempts to have him resign and he has refused to do so? So remember, we are launching a campaign, a campaign that makes everybody aware that there are these issues. Remember that Mr. Ramposa is a sitting president, so he doesn't only use his majority in parliament, but he also uses his power to suppress and, 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 and sort of sends that information. I mean, you've seen how the public protector has protected the sitting president. So the SABC, for example, they give out information that they deem fit. So our people, some of our people, they don't get the information correctly. So this campaign has actually led to everybody asking, what exactly is the EFF fighting about? The EFF is fighting about one, two, three, four, five. Now the society knows that Mr. Ramaphosa has done this and this and this because if we keep quiet, the issue of Palapala Pala Farm will die down. And once it dies down, uh, we'll forget about it and Mr. Ramaphosa will never be held accountable. So we want to invite the society at large to say, uh, uh, come join us as we fight. Ompile, how long is this shutdown going to last? And is this sustainable? It is sustainable. So we've launched it today. And only today, the few days that the police have been deployed and the military, it has cost the state 166 million rand. Just, let's say it's three days of deployment. 166 million rand. Imagine, Peter, if we were to hold this for a week, it will cripple this economy. It will never be affordable to Mr. Ramaphosa. And the investors and, and, and business people of this country will say, but we can't sustain this thing of yours. Resign. The people are not happy with you. Another reason why we're taking it to the streets, which is, by the way, our democratic right, which is enshrined in the Constitution of South Africa, is that Every time we take platform in parliament, they tell us that you are 44 member part in parliament and therefore keep quiet. So we wanted to show them the strength and the magnitude of the people on the ground, ordinary South Africans who are frustrated. And that is why you saw us going even to businesses, to approach businesses, churches, everywhere, all sectors of 
the society, we engage them in what we call stakeholder engagement so that we are all on the same page. There is no negative narrative that people are spreading out there about the EFF. Mpile Mautwe is the parliamentarian and the treasurer general of the Opposition Economic Freedom Fighters Party in South Africa. She spoke with viewers Peter Clotty. As the Horn of Africa enters its sixth fail rainy season, the number of internally displaced people in Somalia has reached an all-time high, with millions forced to leave their homes. Abdul Kadir Dubair visited a camp for the displaced in Dolo, Somalia, and has this report as narrated by Salim Salomo. Sheltering from the scorching sun under a tree with her three children, Marian Ali Aden is waiting to be given a temporary place to stay. Aden was forced to leave her home in Waji district of Somalia's Bakol region. The problem that brought us here is that we lost our farms and livestock to the severe drought. Their father used to bring us some food, but it wasn't available anymore. And after we lost everything, we had to flee. Aid agencies such as the UN's International Organization for Migration, or IOM, say the town of Dolo, near the Somalia-Ethiopia border, where Aden arrived, is seeing an influx of people fleeing the multi-year drought that began in 2020. This is Ladan camp for the internally displaced, home to more than 180,000 people. IOM says it has added three displacement camps to house more people. Hassan Mohamed Gabao is with the International Organization for Migration. As you can see, 15 families have arrived in these three new camps in two days. And the number of people arriving is increasing every day. We ask donors, the government and businesses to reach out and assist these people as soon as possible. Otherwise, the situation will get worse. The IOM has also built a camp for the displaced in Barwao. A mother of seven, Faduma Ali Ado, lost one of her children on the perilous journey to the camp. I fled from my home after the drought hit our farm and we lost all our animals. We walked for seven days and I lost one of my kids on the way here. The only animal we brought here was a donkey. Then we sold it to buy food for my children. They have given me this house I live in now. IOM's Deputy General of Operations, Yugochi Daniels, visited a camp in Baidoa and says the impact of the drought is widespread. Baidoa has received the most internally displaced people in Somalia, but all of Somalia is also affected by conflict as well as by climate change. The UN says the number of displaced people in Somalia has reached 3.8 million people this year. While humanitarian assistance is reaching some parts of Somalia, Aid groups say immediate and sustained intervention at a large scale is required to prevent further displacement and a loss of life. For Abdul Ghadur Zuber in Dolo, Somalia, Salim Salomon, VOA News. And that's it for this Tuesday, March 21st edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for spending your morning with us. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.